What did I do there? So I'll just go to it now. Um, we learned that basically every step of the hierarchy except for where QPs fit in. And I claimed that a QP is a special case of what's called an SOCP, a second order cone pro problem. That's actually fairly easy to see. Um, and you can go through this and, you know, offline to make sure this makes sense to you. But I wanted to just talk through it. Remember, an SOCP was a, as a problem of this form. You have a linear criterion. And you have uh, second order cone constraints, as well as equality constraints. So the DI, uh, capital DI and lowercase di, there are given matrices and vectors respectively. EI is just a given vector. It's not necessarily the canonical basis vector in the ith direction. And FI is just a given scalar. Um, and so the constraints are of this form. That was a, a second order cone problem. Uh, a QP is a special case of that. And that completes the, the picture we drew at the start. And you can see that by just rewriting uh, a QP by introducing kind of a dummy variable, T. So where I would have had, you know, one half X transpose QX in the criterion, I replace that with a T, where T is an uh, auxiliary variable, and I add in a constraint that looks like one half Q trans, uh, X transpose QX is less than or equal to T. So clearly that hasn't changed the problem, right? Because um, if we're minimizing over X and T, then making T as small as possible subject to this constraint is, is, has the same effect as putting in one half X transpose QX in the criterion. OK, so that should make sense. And this, you can see now, is actually just a second order cone problem. So you see that by uh, making a variable substitution. So let's call w our new variables, where w is q to the 1 half times x, the, sym the symmetric square root of q, which, uh, which exists if we're assuming that q is positive semi-definite. And then this just becomes uh, basically the norm, the two norm of w is bounded by, um, say, the square root of t. And everything else are constraints you know how to handle in, in an SOCP. OK, so that was the connection, and it completed the hierarchy. Um, so we're going we're gonna to depart now from kind of the fundamentals of optimization uh, or, or fundamentals of convex analysis. And we're going to go right into algorithms. So this is going to be our first unit on algorithms. And the name of this unit is first order methods. So we're going to talk about pretty much exclusively methods that utilize the gradient or information about the gradient. That's what the first order refers to. Um, we'll come back to uh, algorithms basically after another theory unit, which, which we do after this. And then we'll talk about second order methods. So you'll get to see both flavors. And then uh, some advanced ones as well that, that don't really fit in either category. Um, so to, to start us off with first order methods, we're going to talk about gradient descent, which is kind of the, the most basic um, and probably the most widely learned in terms of people who learn optimization, you know, say at a, an undergrad level or a pre-graduate level, they learn gradient descent. But uh, there's a lot of interesting things to talk about gradient descent, and it, it serves as a building block for other algorithms. So we're going to spend a whole lecture talking about it. OK, so I already talked about this. This is the hierarchy we learned last time. So gradient descent, where do we start off? Um, we're going to be considering unconstrained, smooth, convex optimization. So we have some function f. It's smooth, it's convex. Um, so, so by smooth, I mean it's differentiable. And another assumption we're going to make is that its domain is all of Rn. Okay, so we, we, um, the function is well defined over all of Rn. And this is about the, the simplest problem we could ask to solve um, in terms of a convex optimization problem. But we're going to see that what we do here in this lecture is going to serve as a building block for much harder problems where these assumptions aren't met. So what's the, what's the gradient descent method? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if most of you guys have seen this in other classes or have implemented this before. The idea is to basically continually follow or iteratively follow the direction of the negative gradient. So um, we start off with some initial guess, x0. Just pick any point in Rn. And we repeat the following uh, recursion or the following iterations over and over again, where we define xk by by where we were before, xk minus 1, minus some constant tk, just called a step size, times the gradient of f at the previous point, xk minus 1. OK, so when we're starting off we, at x0, we compute the gradient at x0. We multiply that by some constant, t0, uh, t1. And 
we move in that direction. We, we start at x0 and we move in the direction of the negative gradient. And that gives us x1. And then we compute the gradient x1, we multiply that by a constant, and then we move, we take x1 and we subtract off the gradient we just computed, that gives us x2, etc. Okay, so we move in the direction of the negative gradient repeatedly, and we'll just say at this point, stop at some point. We're not going to be specific about when to stop, but we'll talk about that in more detail as we go on. Okay, so here's a picture of gradient descent. Uh, it's the picture I showed when I introduced convex optimization earlier, so now you know what this is actually showing. I'm showing a two-dimensional um, surface here, so it's a, it's a convex, smooth convex function in R2. And you can see that I've, I've actually run three different gradient descent paths that I've showed, or f not three, five, that I've run from five different starting points, and each of them are denoted in a different color. So, for example, just pick any one of these. This was my x0 for this run, and I took uh, the step sizes t to be small, so that, that you can actually see these paths looking kind of more or less continuous. I'm, I'm just plotting the iterates. So I'm plotting here x, x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, etc. And after some number of iterations, you can see I, I descend to what looks like the minimizer of this function, this two-dimensional function. And no matter where I start here, you can see I, I end up at the same place. Okay, so this is uh, foreshadowing what we're going to prove later, which is that uh, this algorithm indeed converges to the, to the optimum. And it doesn't matter where we start, as long as we choose the step sizes appropriately. This was gradient descent now applied to a non-convex problem. So um, I, I took a two-dimensional non-convex function, and I applied gradient descent starting at five different spots. And you can see that actually where I end up, uh, it, it drastically depends on, or, or very strongly depends on where I started. Okay, and it, I don't even need to end up, at, in this case, for a non-convex function at a minimizer. I can end up even at a saddle point. So a spot where the gradient is zero, but I'm not actually at a, at a local minimizer. So we're not really going to talk about um, gradient descent for non-convex problems, just like we're not going to talk about non-convex problems in many details, but we'll, we'll kind of occasionally hint at the fact that a lot of the algorithms that we use don't have guarantees for non-convex problems of the same type. So let's start off rethinking the gradient descent steps and interpret, interpreting them in a slightly different light, which is going to help, be helpful for when we build off of gradient descent in, in a few lectures. Um, at every iteration, let's consider doing a local quadratic expansion to the function, where instead of using the function's Hessian for the second order term, I just use a very simple um, spherical uh, matrix that I'm using to replace the, the Hessian. So in a sense, this is like doing a second order Taylor expansion of my function, f at the point x. But instead of using the Hessian, right, the actual second derivative matrix of f, I replace that by this very sim simple spherical matrix, 1 over t times identity matrix. Okay, that's what this is right here. You can convince yourself that's true. Usually I would have y minus x transpose the Hessian of f at x times y minus x, but I've actually replaced that by this matrix, so I get 1 over t times the norm of y minus x squared. So if we were to do this quadratic expansion, very, very simple quadratic expansion to the function, then we could interpret this as consisting of two terms. Let's suppose we wanted to minimize this quadratic expansion. So I wanted to minimize the right-hand side over all y. I was at x. I wanted to minimize this surrogate to my function over all y. Then there are two terms here that play a role. The first is um, the, the, this guy, which serves as a linear approximation to my function, just f of x plus the gradient transpose y minus x. And the second term I can think of as a proximity term to x, where I was when I made the quadratic approximation, with a weight. So the weight is, is 1 over 2t, let's say. So now we can see the role of t in gradient descent. Um, I'm going to claim that the minimizer to this over all y is exactly the gradient descent update. And that's actually not hard to see. We can just differentiate this with respect to y and set equal to 0 and see that's true. All right, if I do that, then I get, um, let's just, so maybe we'll call it f hat of y for a quadratic as expansion. So as a function of y, this looks like f of x 
plus the gradient of f of x transpose y minus x plus 1 over 2t times the norm of y minus x squared. Um, so let's take the gradient of this and set it equal to 0 to find the minimizer of overall y. What's the gradient of this function, the function of y? You, got, you don't have the excuse that it's early because it's like past noon. So I'm sure you guys know this. So what's the gradient of the first term with respect to y? Yeah. Right. So it's just a linear function as a function of y. So this is like a transpose y. This gradient is just a, in this case, grad f. And how about this term? Yeah, 1 over t times, no, not y, y minus x, right? OK, so shake off the rest from calculus. This, this should be, um, you know, after practicing a few times, this should be more or less immediate to you guys. But you'll, you'll get lots of practice with quadratics, so you can at least internalize this. So that's the gradient of this quadratic function. Um, and we want to set this equal to 0, right? to minimize it over all y. And so what we see is that the, the minimizer, which we might call, uh, in this slide I call it x plus, to denote the, the next update for gradient descent, is just equal to um, x minus t times the grad of f at x. OK, so by minimizing this quadratic expansion over y, I really do get the gradient descent update. And t is the step size in my gradient descent update. And so we can actually see, going back to this uh, interpretation, that if t is small, t is small, then you can see I make a small step, right? I only move a little bit away from x. And how we interpret that is that actually we're placing a lot of importance on staying close to x in forming this quadratic expansion, right? Because the weight in front of this proximity term is very high if t is small. If t is big, and we're not placing very much importance on staying close to x in terms of this proximity term. And we're really trying to minimize the surrogate for the function itself, this linear approximation, which is going to try to take us very far in the direction of the, of the negative gradient. OK, so um, this is just a picture of what's happening. I took a function here. Suppose that the solid function is the function we're trying to minimize. Um, suppose we're at the blue point, x. What gradient descent is doing is that it's forming a quadratic expansion to the function. So that's this dotted line that passes through this point, this blue point. And it minimizes this quadratic uh, approximation to the function. And the minimizer is this red point. That's where we go next. So then we would go back down to the function at this red point. We take another quadratic approximation. So, so form some other local quadratic approximation here, minimize that one, and it would take us closer and closer to the minimizer of the original function. Yeah. Uh, just going back to the previous slide, could we just come up real quick on why we can replace the, the Hessian by this 1 over t times the identity? Oh, I didn't really motivate that. Um, I just said that's what gradient descent does. So, um, what would we need to look up to know where that is? Well, well that, I mean, that's why, that's why gradient descent is tractable. So, what happens if I don't replace, if I actually use this, grad f squared of uh, the Hessian of f in place of the identity? Do people know what that would be? What would the resulting algorithm be that, that iteratively minimizes actually quadratic expansion? It's Newton's method, right? So it would be a second order method. Um, it would be a lot more costly because we would have to basically invert the Hessian, solve a linear system yeah. of the Hessian. No, I was just wondering why this one over t times the yeah. is an approximation. So um, you can imagine that as long as t is small enough, um, this is not really bad, right? Because um, All I, need to, all I need to be sure of, and we're going to see this in the proof, is that the function that I'm minimizing iteratively dominates my function at every step. So I need to make sure that this local quadratic lies above my, my function. If I make t small enough, then you're going to see that's true. There's like enough curvature that it keeps this dotted function above my function. If that's not true, then I'm going to be, um, I'm not majorizing the function I'm trying to minimize. So I might be making a quadratic, quadratic approximation that you know, somehow lies below the original function, and that could be bad. So I'm just saying that um, 
it's not, it's not going to give you a bad answer as long as t is small enough. And the reason the identity is there is, is for computational simplicity. Yeah? Okay, so the main, so main reason why there's a second order expansion is to get something like a block study so it prevents it from going too far from it. Yeah, what happens if we didn't have, what happens if we didn't have this term at all? What would happen if we tried to minimize that? that uh, this would be a, a linear approximation of the function. We would just end up at minus, inf uh, whatever the direction, we go full in the direction of the negative gradient, end up at in somewhere off infinity, right? So it wouldn't be possible without the second order term. That's because this function has, this minimization problem has no constraints. All good questions. Okay, um, so today we're going to talk about the following. How to choose those step sizes, those uh, t's at each step. We're going to actually prove that gradient descent converges to the optimizer. Uh, actually, that it, it, it achieves the optimal criterion values that we're going to pr prove to be specific. And we're going to give a, a rate for how fast it, it achieves, it approaches the optimal criterion value. And we're going to talk about two machine learning statistics variants of, um, of gradient descent if we have time. I usually don't get to these in much time with lecture, so it depends on how fast we go through the proof. But um, we may just choose one of those two. So let's talk about choosing the step sizes to begin with. So there are um, some options for how to choose the step size. The first one is just to choose it to be some fixed constant. So just fix it at some value for all, for all k. And we'll call that common value t. Um, so we're going to go through kind of the, the three possible things that could happen if you choose t too big, too small, or, or right kind of in the right range. So um, I've taken a quadratic function here, two-dimensional quadratic function, 10x1 squared plus x2 squared over 2. And I've actually drawn its contours in R2. So each of these, um, like this, this ellipse, represents a, uh, you know, values of that, uh, the, uh, over which the function has uh, achieved some kind of constant value. OK, so this is, these are just um, contours of my, of my function f in, in R2. And you can think of them as maybe slices through uh, the function. If I were to take slices, these represent kind of the, uh, the boundary points when I take those slices. So I've started off here at some point x0. Okay, and let's say this is the minimizer. The minimizer of this function is clearly 0, 0, this two-dimensional quadratic. And I've run gradient descent with a large step size. And I just run it for eight steps. And you can see what happens is if the step size is too large, then gradient descent diverges, right? It does not approach um, the optimum value. Okay, and the reason is, if we go back to this conversation, this intuition we had before, the, uh, the quadratic approximations I'm forming don't lie above my function. So I'm, I'm going to get some weird things when I start minimizing them. Um, okay, it, what happens if I take t to be too, sm too small? Well, then if we take it too small, then we're not going to be in trouble in terms of convergence, but the algorithm's going to be very slow in the sense that we're going to take many, many steps to get close to the optimum. So I took 100 steps of the small step size. You can see that the gradient descent path looks more or less correct, but I've, um, I've ended up still pretty far from the optimum. And I'm only going to be worse off from here on out because t multiplies the gradient. At the solution, the gradient's going to be 0. And so the effective step size is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so it's only going to be worse off from here out. And of course, you can guess where this is going. If I magically knew how to pick the right step size, constant step size, then I'd be, I'd be doing pretty well. So here I picked the right step size because I knew the function. And I knew what the right answer was for the right step size from the theory I'm about to show you. And so I picked it according to our theory. And after 40 appropriately sized steps, um, it, converged to, it converged very close to the optimal value. Right? I'm very, very close to the solution here. Um, there's clearly a trade-off here, right, in choosing t too big or too small. And the convergence analysis later is going to give us an idea of what the right step size is. In terms, if I happen to know, let's say, the Lipschitz constant of the gradient of the function, the, the, then the, um, the convergence analysis is going to tell us that 1 over the Lipschitz constant is the right step size. Okay, but we don't always know that or it might be hard to compute. So um, typically, we don't actually use fixed step sizes in practice. We use something called backtracking line search, which is a way to choose a step size adaptively at each iteration to make the most progress that we can. 
Okay, so I'd say more often than not, we use backtracking, uh, something called backtracking line search, then choosing a fixed step size. And that is an, a method that proceeds as follows. Um, we fix two meta parameters, beta and alpha. And beta is between 0 and 1, and alpha is something between 0 and a half. And at every iteration, we're going to pick the step size differently based on um, how much progress we, we can see that we're making in, in the direction of the negative gradient. And we start with some guess at the step size that's, say, bigger than um, we think is going to be appropriate. So I just put one here in the slides, but um, you, know, you can start anywhere, and backtracking will still do something useful. If you start at too big of a number, then it may take too many inner iterations for backtracking before it gives you a reasonable, uh, a reasonable step size. So let's just suppose we want to start at 1. Then we're going to repeat um, the following check. We're going to check whether or not the function if I were to take a step size um, in the direction of the negative gradient by an amount t, is bigger than something like a linear approximation to the function in that direction, but where I've degraded the slope of the linear approximation by alpha. And we'll see a picture in the next slide that actually explains that relationship. But uh, you, can, you can just interpret this may lit maybe literally as saying, I want to um, descend on the function f. So I want to be smaller in the next iteration. And I want to be smaller by at least an amount alpha times t times the norm of the gradient squared. As soon as that condition is met, then backtracking quits. If that condition is not met, then backtracking takes the current step size t and it multiplies it by beta and updates it. So it actually shrinks it towards 0 because remember beta was between 0 and 1. So by repeatedly checking this criterion, I'm refusing to take a step size, uh, to take a step of size t until I descend on the function enough, where enough is determined by f of x minus alpha times t times the norm of the gradient squared. Okay, so hopefully that, at least at some level, makes sense to you. And we'll see the picture on the next slide that explains the relationship to like a linear approximation of the function. Okay, so once this is met, we stop shrinking the step size and we take the usual gradient descent update just with that step size. So at every iteration of gradient descent, we, we run this as an inner kind of procedure, this inner backtracking loop, and it picks a different step size for us. And this is simple. It tends to work well in practice. Um, something that people do most commonly is actually just to fix alpha to be equal to a half. And then beta is the only parameter that you're, you're thinking about setting in, in like a meta fashion. Okay, and the trade-offs with taking beta too small or too big should be somewhat transparent. What happens if beta is too big? Like, what happens if you take beta to be 0 0.99999? What would be the disadvantage to that choice, potentially? Yeah? Right, you're shrinking very, very slowly. So it would take you many, many, many um, backtracking inner iterations in order to, to get somewhere reasonable. What happens if beta is like 0 0.00001? What's the disadvantage to that? Then you may overshoot, right? You may be able to take a step size that's big, that's of a certain size, and you may be at maybe 0 0.5 is the right step size, and you start at one, but you end up at 0 0.00001, which is not very it's not it's not effective. That means that the outer iterations for gradient descent will be slow in that case, because you'll be taking slow, small, effective step sizes. Okay, so there's, there's clearly some kind of trade-off here. People people tend to fix alpha to half and beta. People tend to choose somewhere close, a little bit bigger than 0.5, but there's not really a very, uh, a very definitive rule for how to pick it. So here's the interpretation of backtracking um, in terms of uh, a linear approximation to the function. So um, this, this is a picture actually from the Boyd Vandenberg textbook. And uh, in our notation, this delta x is just the negative gradient of f at x. So this is delta x is the direction in which we're stepping. And suppose we're at this point x, and we're thinking about trying to take a gradient descent step in the direction of the negative gradient. And what we do is we compute, um, we compute a linear approximation to our function. Let's suppose we do that first. If we were to actually step in the direction negative t times the gradient of f at x. OK, that would be something, uh, something here, right? And we can't expect to be able to achieve with, uh, with some step in the direction anything that that linear approximation achieves itself. 
Why is that? What is something that we learned about uh, convex functions that makes this picture a kind of a fact about convex functions rather than just an artifact of the way that it's drawn? Yeah? Uh, so in a way, it's connected to that, because this is how, well, so it's not, those are about sets. Think about functions. So what do we learn about the gradient of a, of a convex function, uh, about the first order ex Taylor expansion of a convex function? It always underestimates the function, right? It's a, it's a global underestimator of the function. So we can't ever take a linear extrapolation of the function and ask that we can achieve anything close to what that achieves in terms of a step, right? We're never going to do that. By, by definition of a, of a convex function, it's always going to lie above its uh, first order Taylor expansion. So what, grade, what this backtracking line search does is it takes this and it degrades the slope by some amount less than 1. So alpha, if you take alpha to be a half, then basically it takes this line and it shifts it up here degrades the slope by, say, a factor of a half. And we say that we want to take a step in the direction of the negative gradient, or in this case, just whatever delta x is, such that we do at least as well as this kind of degraded linear approximation to the function. This might be the ideal choice t naught, right? the value which they're equal. But backtracking line search might start at some value t out here, and it would start shrinking t by some amount beta, right, until we, we basically cross this threshold. And so if we, you know, if we took several steps, we may end up somewhere here, and that might be the value that we end up choosing for the gradient descent step. OK? Questions about that? Yeah? So that's possible here. Possible. So the step sizes only get smaller and smaller across the inner iterations of backtracking. Let's suppose I fixed t to be 100 here to begin with. Okay, I started t as 100 every iteration. It could be that like in the third iteration of gradient descent, I take a step size, I end up with a step size of 30. And at the fourth iteration, I end up with a step size of 4.5. At the fifth one, I get a bigger step size again, another step size of, say, 50. There's nothing stopping that from happening. So across iterations, there's no ordering between what step sizes I take, right? It's just that within a particular iteration, I, the inner loops of backtracking only look at smaller and smaller step sizes. Okay, so that, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. When we talk about um, accelerated gradient descent, so it's something we're going to talk about in, I think, three lectures from now. We're going to see actually that we need to modify backtracking so that it actually has the behavior that, we, that you asked about. At every step, you have to actually take a smaller step than when you took the last, the last, backtrack, uh, the last gradient descent iteration. But in general, there's nothing that, um, for, with this prescription, this algorithm, there's nothing that requires that. OK, so in this kind of toy example, I applied backtracking uh, with uh, beta and alpha both equal to a half. So I always fix alpha to be half, and beta I just kind of, I don't know, I pick depending on how I feel that day. But I just chose alpha and beta both equal to half for this example. And we can see actually that we get a, a couple of things that are interesting. We get um, different directions effectively. Uh, well, we take steps of different, you can see exactly uh, that the behavior is exhibited here that you asked about. We have different size steps depend on the iterations and they can be there's not they're not monotone bigger or smaller and uh, it, this only required 12 gradient descent steps so it seems to have been much cheaper than what I did with the appropriate step size right here I, I took 40 gradient descent steps to get to the minimizer here because I was doing something adaptive I only required 12 now if we're talking about computational efficiency we have to remember here that actually there's a bunch of inner loops right every backtracking step itself has a loop. So if I record the total number of steps, it actually ended up being 40 in this example. So exactly the same as the appropriate step size. 
So oftentimes people won't report if they're doing backtracking or some step size optimization, the number of iter iterations required over, the, over the, the life of the algorithm. But it's important to remember those actually also contribute right to the computational efficiency. Um, an alternative to backtracking line search is what's called exact line search. So um, instead of just trying to you know, achieve some sufficient descent condition, which is what this is doing, I want to send by at least an amount alpha t grad of f squared. We actually try to descend to the minimizer along that ray uh, exactly. So what we're saying is that if we were only to move in the direction of the negative gradient, I want to take the step that makes that the function the smallest possible in that direction. That's what exact line search is. You can view backtracking as actually an approximation to the strategy, right? We're not trying to get to the minimizer. We're just trying to descend a bit from where we are. Um, is this problem, is this a convex problem? If I told you f was convex? Who thinks that it is? So why is it a convex problem? Right, one of the properties we learned is actually necessary and sufficient for convexity is that a convex function must be convex along every ray, every line. So this is just one particular line. So if I told you f was convex, then this function, which co let's call this function g of s, it's a convex function of s. So this is perfectly well defined. Um, it's just usually not possible to do this exactly. And approximation schemes, like I could run a univariate optimizer here, right? I could do something fancy like bisection search or um, something, some fancy univariate op optimization scheme. It's usually not worth it. It's usually um, too expensive. And what, what happens in terms of the conversions of, back, of a gradient descent, which, which you cared about originally, it's usually not affected very much by doing something fancy here. So people almost never do exact line search. I just wanted to mention it as, you know, a, a, a theoretical strategy or something that, something that backtracking actually kind of approximates. All right. Um, any questions about step size choices? Yeah. Can you go back to the uh, slide where you had the drawing and then draw the uh, quadratic approximation? This one? Uh, no, uh, the first one you would like to. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you draw the, the criterion on uh, that part? The criterion, the, like the actual function, that's being drawn as, as the, uh, the solid curve. Oh, OK. I can point out what's happening. I thought you meant the objective of the problem, the, the objective function. So if this is, that's, suppose, suppose that's our function. This is the tangent line to our function at our current point x. So suppose this is the point x. Um, and then we, we took some. This is the line. Uh, you know, f of x minus alpha. So here, if you see, if I take um, the direction delta x to be just the negative gradient, we're just going to get, this is where this term comes from. Just get the norm of the negative gradient squared, because it's the inner product of, of it with itself, basically. OK, so that's that line. And suppose we're, we start off at some Step size t, so this is really the point. This is really going to be x uh, minus t times the gradient of that's this point right here. So we're going to check whether or not the function itself, evaluated at this point, lies below this line. That's what the, the backtracking exit criterion is. And it's not true. So we're going to take t and we're going to shrink it by an amount beta. So that'll put us at a, some point here. So this would be the point x minus beta t f of x. OK, but really, we're just going to relabel this beta t times t. That's all that was happening in this slide, right? I said t is beta t. Uh, 
and then we do it again, etc. And so we're, we're progressing, repeatedly checking whether or not we've crossed this line. So maybe we progress to here. And at this point, we do, so we exit. So that's the value of t we end up choosing. Yeah? So that's what exact line search does. Uh, that's not true. Sorry, I take that back. The exact uh, line search does something better than that. But what you suggested is actually just as hard as exact line search, but worse, because it makes worse progress. Yeah. How, so how would you exactly find the intersection, right? So I'm asking you for an arbitrary function to find the value of t at which f of x plus t times um, or f of x times x minus t times the gradient f of x is equal to, in this case, this quantity. That's a nonlinear equation in t, right? So to solve that, that's actually just as hard as this problem, except now we're not even getting to the minimizer, right? We're just going to get to uh, like the suffi sufficient con descent condition. So it's not an easy equation to solve. It's actually exact line search and, and, and doing the exact intersection search here. They're only really possible when f is quadratic. So people don't really do them. Yeah? OK, good questions. Um, let's take, oh, another question. I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Say it again. Uh, what I'm saying is, do a gradient descent is kind of like solving a differential, differential equation numerically using Euler's method. And using what method? It's like following the gradient flow or something. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and there are high order methods to solve differential equation like Euler's uh, method, the fourth order method. OK, I'm not familiar with that. I'm sorry. But I mean, we're going to see higher order optimization when we talk about the second order method. So Newton's method is, a, is an example of uh, an optimization method that uses more than the gradient. So we're going to cover that. So what I'm saying is, like, evaluate, evaluate gradient at the, the first order of gradient at different locations. Yeah. And do a combination. So that, that sounds like quasi-Newton methods, which we'll also talk about. So we'll get to that as well. OK, let's take a quick break. We're going to come back and do the proof of, uh, of gradient sense conversions.